можем отсюда сделать всего технику. Нет, нет, абсолютно. Я тоже так думаю. И как бы и не нужно ничего пытаться. Я ему написал, если ты хочешь, если вы хотите говорить, говорите. Вот ком подключается. Дебаши Снанди. Здравствуйте. 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 Здравствуйте, всех приветствую. Главное, что Мария с нами. Мария спряталась. Да, но она с нами, она нам помогает. Это самое главное. Стараюсь, стараюсь. Только жалко, что вы в этом году не участвуете в дискуссии. Ну ладно. Все впереди. Это точно. Я сегодня смотритель. Хорошо. Мы под вашим наблюдением. Так, я пишу Вальтеру. Володя, угу. Владимир Игоревич, а может быть у господина Акимова... То есть пользоваться ему не наушниками, а прямо микрофоном. По-моему, по я... А, все, ура, все ура. работает. Все прекрасно. Замечательно. Ты, наверное, какую-то кнопочку нажал. Или не нажал. Или не нажал. Нет, ну, сейчас нажал, да. Сейчас вроде все порядок. Отлично. Я написал господину Швимеру, что он может начинать и, и говорить свой текст. Мы его услышим, а дальше, ну, что можно делать? Мы-то его отлично слышим. Виртуальный мир совершенно прекрасен. Мы существуем абсолютно отдельно, как от реальных проблем, так и от э, э, способов их решения, но зато как-то вот комфортнее. Ну, мы начинаем или ждем еще, Вальтер? Я думаю, что люди должны подключиться. Все-таки там 22 человека, если только они не ушли по другой ссылке. Должны были бы начать. Потому что мы ссылочку-то получили не так давно. Что через две минуты? Он будет, как я понимаю. Ну, супер. Я чата не вижу. Я тоже Нет. Не вижу да, он написал, что он выступит и убежит. Э, убежит. А, 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 а. а как здесь делать, что не все? А как ему отправить сообщение? Напи выходишь а в чат. Видите, где в чат входишь. Теперь там все. У все справа есть стрелка. Чат, да. Нажимаешь на эту стрелку и отмечаешь там того, кому ты хочешь отправить. Я попрошу Леонида Марковича начать, потому что с Вальтером нет, нет связи. Давайте я тогда поприветствую вас все-таки. Ага, ага, давайте. Да. На русском, на английском как будет лучше? У нас все-таки такая атмосфера. Как мы вообще по-английски, но как... как ну, давайте по-английски. Давайте. Давайте. Dear colleagues, on behalf of the Dean of the Faculty of Global Studies of the Lomonosov Moscow State University, I welcome you at the Moscow University at the 6th International Scientific Congress Globalistics 2020, Global Issues and Future of Humankind. 
The Congress is a main platform for interdisciplinary dialogue in the field of science and education. Formation and strengthening ties between scholars from all over the world. It is held under auspices of UNESCO and focuses on the study of global issues and the future of humanity. The Lomonosov State University is traditionally organizing and hosting the conference since 2009. This year, the Congress is associated with the uh, 265th anniversary, anniversary of the founding of Moscow University, the 75th anniversary of the foundation of the United Nations, and the 15th anniversary of the Faculty of Global Studies. So it's a very special year. This year, near uh, 10,000 participants from 76 countries hold the discussions on the uh, 35 Congress platforms. This year, uh, among our participants, the Club of Rome and the World Academy of Art and Science, the Philosophical Society of Russia, and many, many very interesting and uh, partners. Uh, the Congress has two sessions. The first took place this May. Now we have the autumn one. We are very glad and honored that the International Institute for Social and Economic Studies is participating in our Congress for the second time. The spring discussion was very interesting and attracted much interest of the scientific community. And we wish you fruitful work and success and hope for the future cooperation of the University and Institute, of, Institute for Social and Economic Studies. We hope that our cooperation will be not uh, in the form of uh, only of uh, Congresses, discussion, discussions, maybe I believe it will be uh, something more deep and uh, something we could meet each other, we could participate in uh, the uh, events of each other, we'll organize something, some joint projects and discussions. So thank you for your participation, welcome, and I hope today's sessions will be also very interesting and fruitful. Thank you very much. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, we have a problem with communication with uh, the president of the Institute, Walter Schwimmer. He can talk, we can hear him, but he can't uh, hear us. So I'm trying to email him and ask him to start, but, but for some reason he doesn't do it. So uh, if, uh, if we want to proceed, I would uh, very kindly ask Professor Leonid Grigoriev to deliver his uh, main uh, uh, presentation from where on we would start to uh, communicate, elaborate, discuss, and possibly uh, listen to some other presentations. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Vladimir. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome all. I'm happy to be present with you. Um, I have uh, rather long presentation, I will be moving very fast and understand that I'm allowed to speak about 15-20 minutes. Uh, let me say uh, before I started why I'm doing it, uh, in what capacity. I'm advisor to the government agency, uh, not government service, but it's government paid agency advising and uh, scientific head of the Department of Global Economy in High School of Economics. So I teach everything from uh, business cycles to the course for masters at politology on the difference between Anglo-Saxon, continental European and, and Asian market economy, capitalism and mafia. So probably everything. Uh, uh, here, um, I will show you a few slides and a few uh, bullets 
So you will read yourself faster than I will read them. I will not repeat them because it's normally uh, easy to uh, much more easy to read uh, the lines on uh, the situation how coronavirus pandemic uh, and the recession 2020 crushing everything. So the title of the recession, I will you will I will um, bring um, my presentation up in a second. And we'll go very fast. Just Leonid, у меня нет ощущения, что здесь есть презентация ваша. Вы можете еще раз? I will show myself, no problem. Oh, oh, great. Seeing it? Отлично. Just a second. Up. Up. That's it. So I was thinking. I was thinking about the Thai title. So uh, I am proceeding under the slogan rethinking of everything. Perfect. And uh, it's probably really, by, it, it wasn't that way in April. In April, you remember IMF uh, uh, brought with a forecast for minus 3% GDP on the assumption of OPEC plus oil agreement. And on assumption that pandemic would last half a year. Now, pandemic is clear probably forever. Uh, we have second wave in Europe and first uh, wave, uh, you know, very, very uh, severe uh, wave in India, Brazil, and other countries. So there is not quite clear how it can end. So if we didn't know how it would start and what to do, now we don't know if it would ever this pandemic would be out. Uh, you have a uh, very short, uh, the shortest possible assessment, uh, what I'm going to say. So you basically may skip the rest. Uh, because my, uh, my message is very simple. Uh, pandemic came uh, not at the end of the uh, business afternoon, not at the time of the crisis. So recession, a recession came without crisis. Second, uh, recession, uh, recession quarantines stopped uh, consumption of uh, services, mostly of the rich people. No, to make it simple, upper classes, upper middle, 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 no, at least fifth quintile. Uh, you have all the numbers here will be in, all the pictures will be from the um, uh, recent weeks, including the new IMF uh, report. Uh, report is very, uh, I will go through the uh, slides. This is pandemic as it looks like now. Uh, it's obvious that other developing countries and um, uh, emerging economies are at a very high level and the United States is the high stable level. Just states are changing each other. Uh, which has more problems. So we, there is no, <laughs> nothing, in the, <laughs> nothing in the end of the tunnel at the moment. And be, uh, before going to the end, uh, before you are tired of me, uh, let me say that we form a Roman Empire, now it's a huge Mediterranean uh, recreation place. And the whole uh, year, summer of uh, recreation was lost, all incomes. That's why France, Spain, and Italy have much, be uh, much worse results uh, in terms of decline of the uh, GDP expected this year when, say, Germany or on some other countries. That's the problem. And uh, besides uh, the stoppage of global avio, uh, communications, moving of people, especially in business class. Let me remind that all profits of uh, air carriers coming not from uh, economy uh, class, but from business class. Uh, so it, uh, it deleted 5 million barrels a day of uh, aviation kerosene. Before these 5 <laughs> million uh, barrels a day of kerosene would come back, so our general decline is from 100 to 90. Half of it is kerosene. Uh, before this kerosene would come back as, as a demand, uh, it requires hotels back, 
swimming back, sun back, caravit uh, uh, out, uh, trust back, uh, business class back, and so on and so on and so on. Before it comes back, there is no for fledged recovery in Europe, just no chance. Uh, so the only chance for recovery in 2021 uh, is if some trust in communication would come back and the normal economy would be returning. Uh, besides, and that must be done by spending of the rich people. <coughs> it's very simple and actually, actually trivial, but it, it took some time for me in Moscow to move it into brains. Uh, the group before, uh, let me uh, just show for the demonstration, but on one, on one hand, high income economies were affected uh, much worse than low income economies in the previous decade. Uh, but this difference is in the growth rates is completely insufficient, insufficient for any catching up in any uh, um, convergence of the level of development. We live in the world uh, in which actually the line, uh, linear distance between rich and uh, middle income, middle income to poor countries is increasing slowly but increasing uh, we saw theorem and lucas theorem we don't work in practice i teach I now teach it to postgraduates uh, this is uh, where we are according to imf october report uh, and it's obvious that the uh, growth rates were a bit uh, down to the right from uh, on as we see it on the, on the graph to the right from the crisis in uh, 2009. Uh, but besides, uh, it will take pretty uh, difficult time to come back. On coming back, uh, forget for a second about uh, calculations in uh, purchasing parity parity, uh, power parities, uh, in which the decline is minus 4.4, and the growth next year is 2.2. 5.2 or something like rhetor looks like rhetoric because it's a fake a fake news of statisticians and I'm part of the conspiracy against people in politics, media and others against you uh, essentially because the purchasing party completely wrong measure in the dynamic of the crisis. Purchasing pay, uh, poverty parities were invented only to measure difference in uh, living standards between different countries, not for business uh, cycle dynamic. Look here in uh, a normal uh, um, conversion exchange rates, and you have global output in 21, um, basically lower, very, 21 is not the same as uh, 19, but look down, if we deduct China, Oh, it's it's very easy. Just deduct uh, one sixth of the global uh, volume, and it's obvious that advanced economies are not recovering in twenty one, and most of the world is not recovering in twenty one. Uh, uh, in twenty one, uh, in twenty one, we will be down from twenty nineteen. So, in terms of the uh, coronavirus, there is no nothing in the tunnel. Uh, nothing interesting <laughs> in the tunnel. In terms of recession, we definitely are in the uh, very serious troubles in 2021. Uh, we, um, we may count on recovery in 22. Uh, this is by sectors. In Russian, we accidentally translate uh, sub notes to Russian, but uh, I can tell you that uh, the uh, big declines in activities, that's obviously uh, trade, transportation, catering uh, on the top right slide. So basically nothing since uh, that's rich people who stopped to go to uh, Vienna's opera uh, because all Russians were going to Vienna's opera uh, in winter. That's normal. Uh, well, not all Russians, it would be too much, but all Russians with capability to buy a ticket to the opera. Uh, transportation was easy. Uh, uh, so that's, that's exactly services which were affected by uh, a stoppage in quarantine on consumption of services by uh, rich people. Uh, we want returning rich people to buy these services. There is no hiring. Uh, poor people in uh, small businesses were affected immediately, but as a result of the first blow. 
uh, this is uh, how it looks like with retail sales on the left. Um, what's interesting, psychologically, people were happy about the growth in the third quarter this year. Oh, it's a growth, everybody happy. It's complete nonsense. It's complete nonsense because uh, it, we came from minus uh, 20, minus 15 to minus 10 level uh, to the initial uh, position, uh, pre crisis position, pre recession position. So, uh, minus 10 is a huge crisis uh, by itself, much more deep than 2009. So, the third quarter, if the fourth quarter would be much more uh, difficult uh, and deep uh, in the recession when the uh, 29. Uh, we, even uh, it's about about the second. It's it's uh, just forget, forget about the, forget about these quarterly differences. It's a very deep crisis. Uh, it's time to read the book of uh, Walter Shaden. I teach it for a couple of years since I had purchased it uh, about equality and equality. I have a few slides on it, uh, but it's time to read it because um, First World War. And great upturn in the 20s uh, reduced inequality a little bit in the United States. Uh, but basically, basically, we live in a world which is unequal, uh, about the same as pre uh, First World War. This is a couple of slides for information. Since this, uh, I will just will put this um, uh, um, presentation to chat to everybody at the end of my presentation. So just for your information, and we, uh, as Schwarzenegger said once, I will be back. He's back. He's back. Uh, this is a probably, uh, um, ho hopefully I'm not interfering in American elections, because the curve is from 2009. It's American calculations. Uh, uh, we say it's a very simple information. Uh, one percent of American population spends one more than twenty percent of healthcare. Five percent spends half, and uh, down uh, low half spends nothing. So we have a perfect demonstration how very rich country with high inequality and private healthcare uh, was preparing for the uh, pandemic. It they made something completely. Contrary to what is necessary at the time of pandemic. So no complaints, uh, I think, from the... Uh, and the reform of healthcare probably will be on agenda uh, very soon ahead, may, uh, on the level, maybe ahead of uh, energy and climate, because climate is uh, half... Uh, main travels with uh, climate uh, will be about half a century from now. <laughs> pandemic is today. Uh, or you're treating everybody, or poor people uh, will be carrying infection to rich people in the next uh, five years. You will, will never uh, do anything. Um, uh, this, uh, this graph, I published it uh, in my work. If anybody interested, there is my chapter um, in Springer uh, book. Uh, at the end, I have my publication. It's mentioned, it's easy to find. Uh, I quote Crocodile. Crocodile. Why crocodile? From 1 to 91, these are countries uh, by growing GDP per capita, of course. I look just at the green line. Green line is the difference uh, of income of 10th decile, richest 10th uh, decile, and second quintile, not the poorest quintile. Forget about poor because somehow uh, countries are feeding poor. Who are people uh, in the second quintile? These are people who are serving the 10th uh, decile. So these are people in the hotels, the restaurants, transportation, and so on. These people are affected by this pandemic. And the, uh, the gap between uh, 10th uh, decile and second quintile was growing and uh, with the growth of GDP per capita and between 2000 and 2016. These are yellow jackets. On global level. Uh, this is a uh, uh, nice calculations. There are a few of them, uh, but with the same result. Uh, global inequality is not declining. 
if you are uh, taking out uh, China in India uh, for last quarter century, uh, it wasn't declining. If you are calculating, we wrote without a huge uh, impact of China in India. That's nice. Uh, I congratulate uh, our friends in uh, China in India, but the rest of the world is uh, as it had been. Uh, macroeconomics of this crisis. Uh, monetary authorities, central banks and minister of finance, were so afraid uh, of this recession. And we had learned the lessons of the Great Depression of 1929, uh, which were reassessed in 2010 after the previous crisis. I just finished it with a big piece, uh, 60 pages on Roosevelt and his reforms. Uh, but basically, I, um, I started with the upturn of the 20s, uh, Great Recession at the time of Hoover, and reforms. So one of the mistakes of the Hoover's time uh, was uh, Federal Reserve System was not fighting the crisis. Uh, crisis was three months ahead, and uh, Federal Reserve was rising uh, the uh, rate of lending, lending rate and re, um, um, repurchase rates for businesses. So we aggravated um, the so-called liquidity crunch in the uh, September, October of uh, 1929. Uh, as uh, Alan Greenspan in his brilliant book mentioned, I believe it was him, uh, mentioned that the uh, leadership of uh, Federal Reserve System was collected mostly uh, by the affiliation by the same golf club. And the only good businessman who was on the board of Federal Reserve System at that time had died in 1928 period. So, uh, Federal Reserve Systems all around the world had le have learned the uh, lessons and we put it huge liquidity. All Maastricht's normal gun. Everything, uh, cheap money uh, came in excess. And the problem is that uh, when liquidity comes uh, uh, and investments uh, goes down, uh, cheap money go to two directions. Uh, to stock markets, so we have unusual behavior of uh, stock market indexes, and to real estate. So there is new, uh, new arranged uh, boom on real estate prices. It means uh, boom is fine, but bust on the real estate market is inevitable, but it will be not immediate. It will take a year, oh, some years. Uh, that's how it looks like. If you look just to one point on the very right, of the uh, right slide, you see five trillion dollars additional liquidity from uh, bank, uh, Central Bank of uh, Japan, United Kingdom, Federal Reserve System, and Central European Bank uh, in half a year. In half a year, that's why you may enjoy stock prices. In uh, you may, if you're uh, going to sell a house, do it now. This is uh, for just information. It's a calculation on the difference on, uh, on inequality. I'm coming to inequality uh, at present. This is a, sta um, a standard table. Uh, look at the difference between income share of 10th uh, Dezels uh, income and um, uh, the share of wealth. Wealth is financial wealth. It's, not, it's without houses, of course. A land of that kind of things. Uh, it's well known long ago, uh, long before Pic <laughs> Piketty knew it, it as a student of Atkinson. Uh, so nothing new about it. It's trivial. The important that uh, nobody wanted to talk about it. Now it's a, a serious problem, uh, but as Shadow demonstrated for the previous time, and believe me, there will be some declining of visible inequality, but not because rich people became poor in this crisis. Not at all. On the contrary, uh, rich people were prevented from spending to support poor who are servicing restaurants, or hotels, and uh, air carriers. Uh, so uh, rich people received additional forced savings. And this forced savings is a second source of money which came to financial markets and real estate, plus from uh, plus to the central bank inflows. Uh, this is a, a just um, uh, calc simple calculation what is 
on the lockdown, what is not on the lockdown. Uh, two important, it doesn't require any comment, uh, comments for you. Uh, just look at the world worldwide. Uh, two important remarks. Of course, not everything on the left is locked. Not everything on the right is growing. Especially uh, which um, uh, which line uh, which column was under the most uh, severe blow this year? Healthcare. We have very strange case in Russia. In half uh, first half a year. The uh, all these um, uh, uh, standard uh, diseases, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, all typical uh, flus uh, came down by 20%. People were afraid to go uh, uh, discover they are tested for uh, COVID. Uh, the, uh, the main decline in services in the United States is in healthcare. Because increasing care for uh, pandemic uh, didn't compensate a bit, huge dec decline of visiting uh, medical services by rich people who just stopped doing all these uh, treatments, uh, psychologists and everything. It's a huge decline of incomes. Uh, the same is important uh, if you are going by quintile, let me remind what fifth quintile uh, on the right is the most rich people. This is a share of entertainment. Uh, Spain is strange, maybe it's some fake, uh, Spanish fake statistical news or something, I don't know. But for other countries, look at the Great Britain. What does it mean uh, fifth quintile spends uh, uh, receive 30%? Um, actually, it means that it's about one third of uh, this um, uh, one third of his uh, number is uh, service, uh, services. Uh, it is a third of the um, uh, spendings. Uh, one third. Uh, the fifth quintile in the United Kingdom spends almost half of, of exp uh, personal expenditures, forty-seven percent, like in Russia, by the way. Uh, it means that about fifteen to sixteen percent of national personal expenditures are services of rich people of the fifth quintile. Half of them affected. So we have five, seven percent decline of personal consumption immediately just by as a uh, standard, uh, standard uh, trivial observation. Uh, this is again, uh, it's probably just repeating the same slide, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, tourism is affected the most severe, but uh, it, it looks like people still treating uh, tourism as something extra. Okay, it's extra for poor people. We have one week. It, uh, Russians were going in uh, millions to Hainan. For, uh, from Siberia, people were going to Hainan. From central Russia, people were going to Turkey or uh, some other warm countries for a week or two, uh, we lost this, uh, this luxury. Uh, the issue is it's affected most of countries. This is a fourth type of countries. I will not read it. It's obvious as soon as you have this classification, it's all obvious. Uh, but it's interconnected. You cannot reestablish the income uh, uh, in business activity in small countries of uh, first or fourth uh, type, just because there is no demand. Uh, and uh, Gutierrez, uh, General Secretary of United, uh, Mr. Gutierrez, already mentioned recently that uh, 2020 is adding probably 150 million people back to the severe poverty. Uh, so uh, it's time to recalculate uh, numbers of poor people in the world. Maybe we are back to 2000 at the start of Millennium Goals. Uh, just because uh, economy, uh, demography was growing, uh, number of, uh, was growing mostly in poor countries. And um, with this uh, recession of 2020, uh, we are back to the poverty and we start again. And we start again. Uh, this is a sad picture for everybody. I have all of them you know, for the whole world. But look at the Rio de Janeiro. Uh, on the top is the uh, uh, small uh, dark spots are favelas. 
on the down, uh, on the same spots are um, corona, uh, coronavirus concentration. It's done on 25th of May. Believe me, it's, I, I just not, I didn't ask. I have a student uh, with Portuguese which is working with me on Brazilian reforms. I didn't ask for renew, just uh, it's too sad. Uh, but it's a uh, good place to say which countries were more affected by infection and unfortunately by a loss of human lives. Basically, that's uh, countries not exactly poor, but with very high inequality and with a high concentration of poor people in the congested areas, that kind of favelas uh, in Brazil, uh, but it's the same type of concentration in Brooklyn, uh, some places in the UK, uh, or in Belgium, uh, because uh, instead of asking Russians how they uh, uh, calculate the uh, domestic numbers, people should think why British losses per, uh, per million are three times more than in Germany. That's the problem. And why Belgium is uh, one and a half worse than uh, the Holland. Uh, relative inequality. People used uh, to live with the idea that relative inequality is moving the road and helping, uh, giving aspirations and targets and uh, creating, the, um, uh, creating the drive. That's true. That's true. No problem about it. The problem, uh, there are two, and people are very afraid always about proletarian revolutions. So there is no proletarian revolution uh, now because there are no proletarians. We have yellow jackets who is unhappy, uh, but we are not exactly revolutionary type. So uh, the societies uh, in the world uh, uh, have managed to keep poorest people more or less fed. But it doesn't make everybody happy. And relative um, inequality and demonstration of inequality are very important. Uh, let me remind about uh, sustainable development. Now I'm coming to sustainable development goals. I have a few articles I can send it uh, now in English uh, on, uh, as well by chat uh, or any other means. Uh, my point, uh, I'm writing with a few friends with great knowledge of ecology and other things. Uh, one point, C uh, sustainable development goal number three, healthcare, doesn't have anything on the uh, COVID. Uh, the, state, uh, the statement is uh, eliminate all epidemics by 2030. Come on, there is nothing uh, we can do. It's good if we, by 2030 we'll be out of this pandemic. No, maybe early, but you need to rewrite it. The problem of healthcare organization globally is uh, actually actual because without global uh, monitoring of pandemics, vaccination, and other things which require trust, organization, uh, management, we will we are just will be moving from pandemic to pandemic. Uh, another point is CDG number 10, inequality. It's a nice point in the CDG in general, but there is no indexes and no targets for inequality in CDG. Uh, just CDG, uh, inequality is bad, let's, let's do less inequality. Let me remind, there is no convergence of countries by groups. We are moving aside. You know, like uh, space, uh, planets, systems. And slowly, but apart. And uh, domestic ine social inequalities are rigid. And we are rigid, uh, and there is no working umbrella of Simon Kuznets. Uh, we respect him very much. Uh, both theorems are brilliant, but practice of the last 20 years demonstrate very stylized facts of the last 20 years. There is no convergence, there is no uh, umbrella. Uh, and, and technically, if you have the same share, uh, and GDP is growing, then that is kind of departing from the rest of the society. So if, uh, if Marx would be looking right now to the uh, Western society, he probably would adjust to the... Uh, he understood, by the way, 
uh, Marx understood the importance of middle class. He mentioned it in his com Communist Manifesto, uh, but he observed the pauperization of the middle class. So if he would be looking at the current society, he would be probably talking with 10th death of common is living the rest of the society. Uh, it doesn't mean you can, you cannot do any proletarian revolution about it because it's not <laughs> his, the rest of his theory is completely, we may argue what, uh, what it meant, meant it. 19th century were definitely not applicable now. Uh, but it's a problem for real people living now. Um, uh, that's about uh, just for information. I made some uh, connection, two type of stages, stages of coming out of pandemic and stages of recovery. Uh, the problem is that we uh, were moving out, uh, but second wave in Europe and uh, strong first wave in developing countries stopped us. It, it, so we are turning uh, probably not uh, from a big decline, not to the, the fast recovery, but maybe to the kind of stagnation, not stagnation, it's a wrong term, uh, slow recovery. Uh, if the crisis, uh, financial crisis 2009 was the crisis, as we know it, uh, um, uh, this crisis I call, uh, let me, uh, it will be probably that way, it would be uh, capital L crisis. So it's decline and kind of slow out. Not maybe stagnation like it in the early 30s, because that was artificial. Uh, Federal Reserve System and uh, competitive devaluation, everything, they just, all the institutions failed. So it was a uh, uh, um, Great Depression with failed institutions. Now we know much better, and I would say monetary authorities and everybody doing much better than at that time. Still, there is, if we wouldn't overcome the uh, mistrust and, and infection, two, two things, not just one not just COVID, mistrust. Now, we will not we, uh, start the mutual recovery because uh, it's like moving out of the uh, well. You cannot move it by uh, walls. You need two free backs uh, to press and uh, go up. Uh, so it's, it's a very, uh, I'm uh, not very optimistic on cooperation and restoring of global governance. If there is no restoring some coordination, if there is no restoring some trust and some cooperation, uh, buckle up for the long for the long recession. Just for technical reasons, it doesn't. It's not something philosophic or political. We will be no five million billion barrels kerosene used for planes. We will be no travel, no migration, no hotels, no recreation, no demand for uh, sun buff uh, in France or Spain. That's a problem. And finally, oh, that's references. So here I will stop. Uh, and my call is now, and I will uh, leave the uh, podium, <laughs> and I will send this, uh, this a presentation and attach in our article published in this August by the title. I will show you. Uh, the title is uh, bam, 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 bam. It's the first one. Oh, uh, look, the first one. It's the search of the uh, contours of the post COVID sustainable development goals. It's uh, connected to BRICS, ignore it. It's just published. Uh, we are trying to call for common sense and cooperation to get out of pandemic and get out of recession. So maybe CDG is a subject to, for discussion. Thank you very much. Mr. Moderator, I finished. Uh, but you're not lost. I mean, <laughs> uh, thank you very much for, for your brilliant presentation. Uh, I had to smoke a couple of times because there is a certain difference between what we read, what we uh, what we uh, hear uh, on TV and uh, other uh, sources of mass <clears throat> information. And uh, it really will take some time before we 
hopefully understand that there are some other uh, problems which are more important than borders or uh, uh, different types of uh, uh, statistics. Cheating, by the way, our institute started with one year. Uh, the first year we have restarted in 2016. We have been uh, working on st statistics and we found out that uh, every country provides their own statistics. Uh, and uh, late Professor Simchera, who was a great specialist there, uh, wrote about GIGA, garbage in, garbage out. So uh, thank you very much for stressing this point and hopefully uh, we'll do uh, 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 maybe a couple of more seminars, maybe not within the scope of Moscow State University, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll have some other uh, uh, partner for uh, trying to uh, at least uh, uh, formulate uh, the uh, international position, which is much nearer to what uh, uh, higher school of economics in Moscow doing. I, I mean, you can be doing it without us, but we'll be happy to we'll be happy to promote this kind of understanding, which is uh, uh, more based on uh, verifiable data and uh, critical judgments of uh, uh, certain uh, aspects uh, of CDG because we see them as a kind of a solution and we somehow try to count on something uh, which does not exist no more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm. If you are not against it, I, I, will, be, I will be happy to uh, uh, ask Alexander Akimov, who is the, uh, in my personal view, working uh, together with him for about 40 years, uh, uh, his uh, understanding of uh, both uh, demographic and economic uh, uh, parameters, uh, uh, though from one point of view could be called conservative because we all come from late Soviet Union school and this is not about liberal or, or conservative, but uh, the great uh, privilege of having both uh, Leonid uh, Markov and uh, Alexander Akimov is that they use absolutely contradicting methodics but come to the same kind of conclusions. So it's, it's what we call verifiable data and they are not, they are not speculating on this. Alexander, uh, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Vladimir. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, Professor Grigoriev insisted on negative sides of the present situation. I just want to emphasize that not everything is so gloomy. There are some good signs of what's going in what's going on. My presentation is named Technologies of the Fourth Industrial Revolution and their adaptation by public institutions to the pandemic. Uh, in more simple words, I am going to speak about uh, the triangle COVID-19, model technologies and human society, and what's going on within that triangle. Uh, uh, first slide, please. Is it possible to show my presentation? Uh, the first slide of my presentation is just uh, a general overview of the situation. There are, th there are two scenarios of the uh, future. The first one is mm, rather positive. Uh, I insist that everything may quickly return to the old norms. Uh, thank you. The next, uh, the next slide, please. Uh, the next slide. Uh -huh. Thank you. It's okay. Okay. And the uh, second and the second scenario is uh, negative. The pandemic is dragging on, thus reducing contacts between people, 
and thus we will have everything uh, Professor Grigoriev just um, described. And uh, um, how do modern technologies manifest themselves in the extraordinary conditions of the pandemic? It on the slide, please. Ah, thank you. There are two directions. The first one is medical, that is treatment of the disease. And the second one is economic and technological. Uh, this is the ensuring the life of society in a pandemic. The medical field has two distinct manifestations. The first one is uh, biotechnological. This is uh, the creation of a vaccine. The second is communication. This is uh, very important as well because the communication of physicians in the internet uh, um, make them exchange uh, um, the information about the disease and ways how to treat it. And uh, any successful experience instantly becomes a common knowledge. And that is very important. Uh, there are also two aspects of ensuring the life of society in a pandemic. Um, they appear because the pandemic affects the economy, removing people who are either sick or guaranteed from their working places. And um, the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, how do public institutions work in both directions? So the first one about, um, uh, about treatment of COVID-19. Uh, the, the most important institutions, all of them, are those that provide international links since the pandemic is a global phenomenon. First, it's uh, the social networks of doctors who communicate about their experience. And secondly, there are specialized international organizations. And the primary of them is the World Health Organization. But in addition, before the pandemic, several institutions were established. They are the Coalition for uh, Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, CEPI that was established several year, years ago in um, Davos in Switzerland. Uh, the next one, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. That's a general charity foundation, but it, uh, it is targeted on medical issues uh, mainly. And the third one is GAVI. Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. Uh, it is targeted uh, at um, children immunization, but still any immunization, uh, all immunizations have similar uh, features. And on the basis uh, of these organizations, of these institutions, during the pandemic, the ACT initiative, that is access to COVID-19 tools, was created. And it is very active, contributing to global efforts uh, to combat COVID-19. And you can see how many uh, versions of uh, um, COVID-19 vaccines are now in development. And considerable sums of money are raised uh, to ensure immunization of the whole global population, including uh, poor countries. Uh, uh, the next slide, please. Uh, when we turn to the providing survival and comfort uh, and comfort e in the context of the pandemic. Business comes first. 
international organization just uh, did not prevent businesses from operating during the crisis. And as a result, the crisis did not cause violences in the material provision of life uh, because it uses labor-saving technologies. And in modern material production, only such technologies are used. Uh, well, um, just um, a citation. After winning the Battle of England, Winston Churchill, appreciating British pilots, said, Never before in wars so many owed so much to so few. And now we can say, never before in pandemics so many owed so much to so few. So all these labor-saving technologies uh, made it possible to live comfortable even when there is high unemployment and many people are out of work. Uh, next slide, please. Let's go back to the uh, second negative scenario. Uh, I absolutely agree with Professor Grigoryev that the second scenario may be a long-term challenge. And Dine says that the possible answer is basic income. Uh, its properties uh, are shown uh, on the slide. The concept of basic income has for many years been discussed in Europe. And uh, Finland, India, and Brazil had consider considerable experiments with this tool. Um, basic income attracts attention when analyzing the, the consequences of the development of labor saving technologies, such as robotics and artificial intelligence. But the pandemic also forces people to turn to it since it is pushing out a large number of people from the service sector. There are two diseases, technological unemployment and COVID-19 uh, unemployment, but there is only one remedy, the basic income. Uh, the next slide, please. The next, uh, thank you. Uh, here you see the benefits um, and the risks of the uh, basic income. The appeal of basic income is that it is a universal solution to social problems, uh, but it does not hinder business development. Uh, uh, the social problems were uh, named by Professor Grigoryev, uh, and uh, there are many of them. Uh, but you can use only one uh, tool to uh, fight with them, to, um, to stop them. Uh, but risk are, risks are also considerable. You need a lot of money to implement it, but Professor Grigoryev uh, demonstrated that central banks uh, have done many steps just to uh, issue a lot of money to put them into circulation. Uh, and also you need a sharp shift in the entire social life. And the risk is that society may not accept it. The next slide, please. Uh, thank you. So what are conclusions? What are the main results of interaction between COVID-19 technologies and um, modern society? The technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, as we can see, were quite ready to meet an expected disaster of COVID-19. And I should say that international public institutions were also able to quickly mobilize to fight uh, the pandemic. Business was also able to provide society with everything necessary during the pandemic. 
Uh, so far at the national level, governments are coping with social challenges. In the future, there is a tool as basic income developed by experts and public organizations. Experts and public organizations have done their job. They can offer this universal tool. But uh, here there are two <laughs> main questions. Uh, the future will show whether this universal tool would be, uh, would be uh, needed or not. And the second is whether the governments will be uh, will win and will be able to use uh, them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Alexander, thank you very much. Uh, Walter wrote me that uh, his equipment is possibly working. Walter, am mm -hmm. I right? Oh, I'm not sure. Okay, sorry. Um, Walter, do you hear me? No. Okay, so uh, since we have somehow organized this uh, in a, uh, let's say, uh, in a way that two reports are delivered and then there is some kind of discussion, but we are uh, very much for form-like atmosphere. Would you like to continue with your reports or would you like to discuss what uh, the uh, reports that has been already delivered? Okay. Uh, shall we proceed with reports then? Hello. <clears throat> Okay. Андрей, ты сможешь что-то сейчас сказать, чтобы тебя долго не держать? Да, конечно, да. So I will uh, then, if uh, if you are not uh, very much for the atmosphere of a democratic forum, then I will uh, ask the director general of the Russian uh, uh, Association for. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, RIAC, which is Russian... Uh, International Affairs Council. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Uh, well, which, is, which is the, let's say, the only official uh, <laughs> uh, represented here in this discussion. Uh, uh, since yesterday we had a very, uh, some important event, uh, which was, which is called Valdai Club, and we have uh, Alexander Rar, who, who is in line to, uh, to talk uh, about it. Maybe Andre will will kind of uh, share his vision of some possibilities of uh, strengthening uh, bilateral relations between countries for the means of uh, preventing pandemic and others. Maybe something uh, something else. Andre, please. Well, you know, when we discussed uh, this event uh, with uh, with you, Vladimir, uh, um, one of the ideas that we <laughs> Uh, was uh, to look uh, at uh, the future of uh, multilateralism uh, during and after the pandemic. Uh, and I think it's an important topic uh, because uh, today many people criticize multilateralism, arguing that uh, uh, it failed uh, to pass the test of coronavirus. And that was see right now is a very deep crisis uh, and maybe even... Uh, a decay of many multilateral institutions, uh, ranging from the United Nations system uh, uh, down to the European Union uh, and uh, other multilateral uh, formats. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, this is an assumption that uh, has to be tested. Uh, I personally believe that uh, it would be premature uh, to argue that uh, multilateralism is uh, on decline. Uh, I think uh, a counter-argument can be made, 
uh, that uh, basically the pandemic has demonstrated limitations uh, of uh, unilateralist approaches, not just to handle this particular crisis, but uh, to uh, the international system at large. Uh, and uh, that uh, maybe uh, this crisis uh, will become a major catalyst uh, for the system uh, to move in the direction of multilateral regimes, modes of operations, and arguably even institutions. Uh, let me take just a few minutes of your time uh, to illustrate my point. Uh, first of all, uh, in terms uh, of uh, uh, clarification of terms, unfortunately, uh, in the Russian foreign policy discourse, uh, there is uh, uh, a trend uh, to uh, talk about uh, uh, multilateralism and multipolarity uh, as uh, the same thing, uh, to use them as uh, synonyms. I think that uh, this is clearly wrong. And uh, though in this and uh, that term they use multi, uh, but uh, the uh, uh, substance uh, is uh, very different, uh, I would say, uh, even opposed, opposing each other. Uh, and let me give you just a couple of uh, manifestations uh, of these differences. When they talk about multipolarity, basically, uh, they usually refer to power. Uh, power, be it the military power, be it uh, uh, economic power, or even soft power, is something that uh, lies beneath the concept of uh, multipolar centers, centers of power. Uh, when we talk uh, about multilateralism, uh, of course, uh, we imply primarily interests, uh, not relative power, but interests of nations or other international actors uh, willing to engage into multilateral frameworks. Uh, this is important. Uh, second, uh, uh, I think that um, uh, multipolarity favors leaders. It's an instrument uh, of uh, consolidating the comparative advantages of leading nations or leading group, groups of nations. Uh, while uh, if we are talking about multilateralism, uh, one of the beauties of multilateralism is that it gives a chance uh, to outsiders, to those who are lacking behind, to relatively weak uh, countries, uh, and uh, to some extent, you can say that multilateralism uh, creates uh, straight jackets uh, for leaders and uh, mitigates uh, their hegemonic aspirations and uh, their hegemonic policies. Uh, of course, uh, multipolarity and multilateralism differ in terms how they approach uh, sovereignty, uh, because uh, multipolarity assumes that uh, sovereignty uh, is uh, the key principle of international relations. And we were reminded uh, of that uh, by President uh, Putin, who just made a statement at the Valdai meeting. He emphasized uh, sovereignty as uh, the key value of the international system. Uh, of course, uh, if you take uh, uh, multilateralism, it, uh, it implies that uh, basically uh, nations and uh, countries uh, should yield a part of the uh, sovereignty uh, to multilateral uh, institutions, uh, and uh, they should invest uh, politically a part of their sovereignty uh, in public goods. So here again, we see a very clear difference uh, between the two notions. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the driver forces of the system are perceived in very different ways uh, by uh, those who support uh, multipolarity and uh, those uh, uh, who stick to multilateralism. Because how a multipolar system evolves? Uh, it evolves uh, through a chain of crises. Uh, these crises are supposed uh, to reflect the change in balance of powers in the world. And uh, essentially, uh, once uh, uh, you see gradual change of powers, uh, then it results uh, with the crisis uh, should, uh, and the crisis uh, actually changes the whole architecture of the international system. Uh, 
former leaders uh, gradually fade away, new leaders gradually emerge, uh, former leaders uh, uh, become status quo powers, emerging leaders become revisionist powers, and uh, in the interplay between status quo and revision powers, uh, you get uh, to a new constellation of the international system. Now, if you get uh, to uh, multilateralism, of course, the perception is different. The perception is that uh, we gradually accumulate uh, 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 accumulate uh, factors of interdependence, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, quantitative increase of uh, interdependence ultimately leads uh, uh, to a leap in quality, which means uh, that we are getting to a new level of global governance or regional governance if we are talking about uh, regional uh, multilateralism. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, very different uh, approach. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that uh, we should uh, make a clear distinction uh, between the two, uh, uh, two uh, frameworks, two paradigms of the international system. Now, if you look at multilateralism in this particular uh, way, I think uh, it is clearly uh, uh, premature to argue that uh, multilateralism has failed. Uh, and uh, though indeed uh, it suffered major defeats, especially at the initial stage of the pandemic, just look uh, at uh, these uh, uh, nationalistic reflexes in the European Union, uh, or the United States closing its borders to its uh, uh, allies and partners. But in the end of the day, I think that especially in Europe, uh, we've been witnessing a, a gradual learning curve of how you deal with pandemics using primarily multilateral approaches. And uh, the outcomes, I think we can now say that, uh, though, of course, uh, the, the COVID uh, pandemic uh, uh, is not defeated in Europe, but in relative terms, uh, the European Union, I would argue, is still doing slightly better than the United States, despite the fact that in the European Union, you have uh, 27 nations, each of them has its own approach to the pandemic. In the United States, you have just one nation, uh, but uh, the outcome uh, of the pandemic uh, in the uh, United States uh, is something uh, that uh, leaves a lot uh, to be desired. Now, uh, having said that, uh, I would also uh, like to uh, uh, argue that probably multilateralism has uh, more chances at the regional level, not only in Europe, but arguably in uh, Southeast Asia, I think that uh, the experience of the ASEAN group of countries is very interesting and very telling. Uh, so uh, it might suffer a setback at the global level, but it might be compensated for this setback uh, by uh, uh, a rather uh, visible progress at the regional level. Uh, let me also argue that, uh, in my view, we still have a problem, uh, primarily a problem of big countries. Uh, which are not used uh, to multilateral approaches. And uh, by big countries, I mean countries uh, uh, like the United States, China, Russia, uh, maybe India to some extent. Uh, and these countries will still have to master uh, the ability to work in uh, uh, multilateral structures and especially in multilateral regimes with no clear leadership and uh, with uh, the rewards uh, that might proceed from uh, multilateralism being postponed uh, till a uh, till long time. So uh, I think that uh, this is uh, something that uh, deserves to be discussed, uh, how we think about the future of the international system after the end uh, of the pandemic and after the end of the economic crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, <laughs> conclude with saying that, of course, uh, the future of multilateralism to a large extent depends uh, on the future of globalization. Uh, here again, we have a setback, very clear a setback, uh, but uh, my personal take is that in a couple of years, so we will see globalization 2.0 uh, when uh, multilateral approaches to the national system will be in demand once again. Thank you. Andrei, thank you very much. And uh, uh, I think that uh, there are 
three, uh, let's say, different uh, uh, ways we could we could proceed up from now. We we have heard about negative and positive scenarios, taking into consideration uh, the uh, negative or might be positive results of COVID. We have heard a lot uh, in the very uh, professional and specific approach to the perspective of uh, multilateral regimes with no clear governance. And uh, this is about, uh, let's say, the variety of views that we have here in Russia. And uh, I would, I'm delighted to uh, give the floor to uh, former uh, India's foreign secretary and a member of the executive council of the Vivekananda International Foundation, uh, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Kanval Sibal. Can you hear me clearly? Okay. Now I looked at uh, the paper you had circulated and, uh, and what you had mentioned that uh, at the end of your uh, <clears throat> note, uh, four or five topics that you thought could be usefully addressed uh, during this meeting. So if you allow me, I have some thoughts on uh, uh, these uh, uh, four or five subjects. One, of course, the first one is awakening of uh, uh, Asia and the globalization of her experiences during a post-pandemic period. Now, insofar as the general term of awakening of Asia is concerned, I think now it's become commonplace. And we've been talking about the awakening of Asia for some years now. It's, a, it's an established fact in terms of uh, shifts of economic and political power in uh, recent years. Um, it was also a fact that COVID-19 seems to have uh, relatively affected uh, the Southeast Asian group of countries less uh, than uh, other countries, especially in Europe and uh, the United States, or for that matter, even countries like uh, Iran. Some say that it is because uh, they had already had experience of the SARS uh, uh, pandemic, and therefore they had uh, uh, protocols in place which helped them uh, to deal with this. I'm not sure whether this is a totally satisfactory uh, answer, uh, but there it is. And to my mind, therefore, uh, no general lessons uh, can be learned from the uh, Asian uh, uh, experience. Now, we've seen South Korea, uh, which made a big success initially uh, because of a very widespread testing. Uh, but then uh, uh, the pandemic uh, uh, seems to be coming back in, uh, in uh, South Korea. Vietnam has been a very successful story. Uh, Nobody is able to say how come <laughs> they have such low rates of uh, uh, infection. Uh, now, in the case of China, now this is the thing, the, whether the China model is uh, universally applicable. Uh, China acted very swiftly. Initially, of course, it seems to have been lax, very lax and allowed, uh, as they say, some of the infected uh, persons to travel uh, across the world, but then they acted in a very drastic uh, fashion. Now, to my mind, uh, uh, while that might be a model uh, for others and it has been copied elsewhere because they are even in the Western democracies, barring USA uh, to, uh, to, to some extent, uh, they try to copy it, but uh, they have not been uh, successful because China presents a very unique uh, uh, situation which is, is a highly centralized and disciplined and authoritarian state which was able to impose a, a total uh, lockdown. I think that model uh, does not fit into democratic societies which are very consumer oriented and uh, very uh, have very assertive citizenship rights, uh, which is not the case uh, in China. I'm not criticizing the Chinese system, but I'm just talking about, about facts. And the, and, the, and the worst example, in a sense, of what I'm saying in terms of uh, consumer-oriented and uh, assertion of individual citizenship rights in the United States of America, uh, where they, they have been in denial, even at the level of the president himself, that, uh, that the pandemic is, 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 a, is a problem. Um, uh, France, uh, UK, you, you've seen how UK has been very, um, uh, very... Uh, 
inefficient in dealing with this whole thing because there's been a huge deal of public resistance and the Prime Minister of Britain has been making appeals to the public to be more disciplined and there's still, there still resistance. I was for three months in London, I could see myself what's happening on the ground. Uh, France uh, has been uh, going up and down because they've been very worried about the economy, certain parts of their economy, uh, and they have eased up, but then they found that uh, the pandemic is coming back, though the number of deaths are much lower than was the case in the past. And now they're imposing uh, lockdowns. They had a curfew, a sort of curfew even in, 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 in Paris uh, itself. Um, so I don't think there is therefore uh, any, any one model uh, that uh, applies uh, to uh, how to other countries, uh, and therefore the, the Asian uh, uh, example, to my mind, uh, may not be very very valid. Each country now has to find a way of dealing with this uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, the, as was mentioned in one of the earlier presentations, uh, the first wave uh, has been uh, was largely addressed. And now we have the problem of the uh, second uh, uh, wave, uh, which is causing problems. So let's see. Uh, the second subject, uh, Mr. Kulikov, that you had uh, put on the table was that after the pandemic uh, and, and the recession, uh, would there be a strategic pause in international relations and uh, the development, uh, and what could be the developments to prevent adverse scenarios? Now, to my mind, uh, I don't think there is any visible strategic uh, pause or, uh, or one can expect such a strategic pause uh, to, take, to, to, to be, uh, uh, be the policy or collective policy of competing nations. Now, I'm saying this because there is a general view. It may be disputed. It may be propaganda. Or it may not be propaganda. But uh, the view, at least in the West, is that China seems to want to profit uh, from, this, with, from this pandemic um, uh, as much as it's possible, because it might see in this an opportunity uh, to, uh, to expand its influence uh, everywhere, because it has come out much earlier than others from the crisis. Uh, even the IMF is saying that it, it will have a positive uh, growth uh, um, uh, next year. Um, and therefore, the view is that uh, China is becoming uh, more confident and it's using these opportunities uh, to take advantage of the situation as much as possible to expand strategically, uh, whether uh, it's in the South China Sea, East China Sea, uh, or for that matter, we are currently, as you know, a serious problem <laughs> with China on our borders with, in Ladakh. And uh, we are genuinely puzzled as to why uh, China when it is log when it is in at loggerheads with the, so many countries around it, including with the United States of America, it chose to open a, a new diplomatic front uh, vis a vis India. Perhaps the assumption is that India India's economy uh, is suffering. Uh, India has also been hit by pandemic, uh, and uh, therefore India may not be able to respond vigorously to what China has done in Ladakh. Anyway, now talking in general terms about uh, strategic pause, in fact, what is happening is uh, that uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, is gaining more weight and strength. And the Quad itself uh, is, uh, is, is gaining uh, more acceptance and uh, there is greater uh, uh, convergence of thinking within uh, Quad countries more than before uh, about the fact that uh, strategically, uh, they have to uh, cooperate on the ground to, to address what is seen as a rising maritime challenge uh, from, uh, from China. Uh, as you know, India has not been very enthusiastic about including Australia in the Malabar exercise between US, uh, in India and Japan, but the decision has been taken and the Malabar exercise will take place uh, this year. I also find that in terms of uh, what is happening in what we call West Asia or the Middle East, the strategic scenario is being changed very, very drastically. One could have never imagined that uh, uh, UAE and Bahrain uh, uh, would establish, uh, with obviously with the concurrence of Saudi Arabia, relations with Israel. 
and uh, this is now um, uh, changing the landscape uh, so so drastically in this region with the consequences which are as yet not uh, as yet not clear uh, then you have of course turkey uh, turkey which has economies in bad shape suffering from pandemic as everybody is but it has chosen this moment to expand itself uh, strategically as much as it as it could and assume the leadership of the uh, sunni world and it has militarily intervened in earlier in iraq of course that was before the pandemic uh, in, in syria and now of course more importantly in the eastern mediterranean uh, and in libya um, so uh, uh, there is this now a crisis emerging in the islamic world between the shias and sunnis uh, as to uh, who uh, is able to get the leadership uh, in germany I, I, it's quite interesting that uh, during this pandemic uh, they have announced a new indo pacific strategy uh, how much of that indo pacific strategy uh, will actually uh, be uh, be given substance to or is it just at the moment a statement of intention uh, it remains to be seen but the fact that germany is the biggest uh, trade partner of uh, china in the eu and in fact uh, maybe and has been uh, the biggest obstacle of uh, of the eu imposing uh, uh, restrictions uh, uh, on china in various ways especially in technology germany has taken the uh, initiative to announce an indo pacific uh, strategy uh, eu china summits uh these summits have not been successful as you know if you see the statements from, which have come from the eu side they if you see the list of all the grievances they have against china it's quite clear that uh, eu china relations are entering into a difficult phase despite the uh, pandemic uh now us has started making open overtures to taiwan despite uh, china's very serious and repeated uh, protestations but britain has sent its development minister <laughs> to, to, to to taiwan and and i think this will be followed uh, by by uh, some other countries uh, on 5g uh, which is of great strategic uh, importance especially post pandemic when digitalization is going to uh, become uh, uh, the race for the future uh, in terms of uh, uh, who will be the leader in advanced technology uh, apart from uk Uh, walking out of the uh, 5G, Sweden has just announced that uh, they were, they have walked out of uh, the 5G, and of course Australia and US, etc., etc. The third subject, uh, Mr. Kulikov, was adjusting the uh, SDGs or specifying strategic development goals. Uh, to my mind, uh, SDGs even earlier uh, were not easily achievable. Yes, they are very desirable, but in terms of uh, achieving them on the ground uh, depended on a whole lot of things uh, including governance in individual countries quite apart from availability of of funds governance is very very important uh, issue uh, but nevertheless that was a target that was being pushed in terms of uh, improving the status of humanity at large especially in the poor countries uh, but now with the economies that have been hit very badly everywhere and uh, prospects of a recession uh, which are very clear and the globalization anti globalization trends and protectionism uh, and, and the expectation that countries are now hit by so many problems at home of unemployment low growth citizen citizen dissatisfaction uh, that uh, countries will be much more inward looking there is a big concern about uh, uh, the supply chains especially in critical areas and whether they should be on shore or whether they should be moved away uh, whatever else so i think uh, uh, in terms of uh, achieving strategic development goals and the support that these must get from the global system uh, i think the, the immediate outlook is not very uh, very bright but in so far as strategic development goals are concerned uh, i i was not very clear when i first uh, saw this phrase strategic development goals but when i thought of it uh, i uh, i think you could include china's belt and road initiative into a strategic development goal and uh, whether under the present conditions 
and the kind of pushback that we are seeing in some countries against the BRI and the fact that uh, US, India, of course, and Australia and Japan and others uh, are now beginning to uh, see the, from, from their point of view, uh, the uh, downside of, the, of China's BRI and are willing to explore uh, alternative options that they can offer to developing countries in terms of connectivity. And of course, uh, they have some new uh, things on the table uh, like the new, um, I forget the phrase, but uh, sort of connectivity for blue dot networks and things like that. Um, so the, 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 there's going to be a connectivity uh, uh, competition. Uh, and then of course, the whole issue of access to raw materials, uh, which is very vital even in terms of digitalization and the whole 5G thing. And that kind of competition uh, would, uh, would continue and the targets of this competition are, of course, uh, the developing, many developing countries, especially in Africa, uh, which have a lot of these uh, raw materials. Fourthly, uh, you had said reduction of cost of learning and re updation of the world, whether this can be achievable through a solidarity uh, effort. Uh, so now, you know, I listened very carefully to uh, Mr. Kortanov, and it's very interesting, and I noted down. Uh, all that he said with regard to the differences between multipolarity and multilateralism. Though I must say that I'm not uh, as sanguine about uh, multilateralism uh, as uh, Mr. Kotanov sounded he was. Uh, the, the entire UN ses current session is devoted to multilateralism and they have to produce a report on this. I think each country will come and wax eloquent <laughs> on how they see multilateralism. But multilateralism will never get off the ground seriously, so long as the uh, United States is hell-bent on uh, targeting uh, Russia and China, two key members of the UN Security Council. Uh, uh, so therefore, the UN Security Council uh, is not going to be, uh, will continue to be as ineffective and perhaps even more ineffective uh, than before. And the US-China spat, which is becoming more and more serious, would greatly hurt, hurt multilateralism because it will divide. It will divide uh, countries, especially in Asia, uh, where the ASEAN is not interested in uh, getting into this, into this uh, uh, spat because they don't want to make these choices. Uh, even Japan uh, would, would want to manage China, but not confront China. And Australia too has deep economic interests there and they would like to be able to curb Chinese ambitions without breaking relations uh, with China, but there's pressure on the Morrison government uh, and Australia has taken a certain line. So I think uh, in terms of uh, um, solidarity effort, I am a bit skeptical that uh, we would have that kind of a solidarity uh, effort. Part of the reason, of course, uh, Mr. Kulikov, is that uh, if you are looking at the pandemic and learning lessons from it, the first lesson that all of us need to learn is what is the source origin of the, of the pandemic and how was the pandemic handled and investigation into it. Now, if you don't do that, I don't think you'll be able to learn the right lessons. And the WHO has suffered because of this, rightly or wrongly. The United States has walked out of the WHO and WHO is the only instrument which could actually give international guidance on how to address the health issues around this, uh, around this uh, uh, crisis. But China is not only disowning all responsibility, it is extremely sensitive, extremely sen sensitive if any finger is pointed at it and, and it has become a very difficult uh, political issue. Even on the question of vaccine, uh, you don't see the solidarity. You have 353 vaccines being developed, whereas there should have been a collective effort to develop this vaccine uh, so that the money that is being spent by various countries on fi finding 353 different routes uh, could be uh, pulled, uh, combined uh, to make a far better pointed international effort. Uh, so this is... This is uh, not happen. The other concern is, which our own Prime Minister of India has expressed, is that, all right, you produce a vaccine, but a vaccine should be available at affordable prices, and there should not be an effort then to, uh, to, to profit from it. Uh, we've seen, we've had experience in the past where, in fact, why the companies are wanting to do this is to, uh, is to actually gain a lead because there are billions to be gained uh, from this. So 
international solidarity would demand that there is, uh, there is clear convergence of thinking on the development and the distribution uh, of, this, uh, of this vaccine. And finally, you have said, uh, Mr. Kulikov, new technology is expected to be developed and implemented during the strategic pause. Personally, I don't think, as I, as I said, that there will be any strategic pause. Uh, but if you really look at what's happening uh, on the 5G front, uh, because that is the that is the end product of these new technologies, and on that uh, there is uh, clearly uh, very intensive competition. Very intensive competition because it is understood that uh, uh, after the pandemic, digitalization is going to uh, or it as it is it has taken off in a huge way. After our conference, look at our conference itself is the product of a post pandemic digitalization scenario. Uh, this is going to take off and the digital digital companies are already rolling in uh, billions their, their capitalization has gone up uh, hugely so in the area of uh, uh, robotics artificial intelligence data uh, the internet uh, of things uh, and the 5g business uh, i think this competition uh, is going to is going to continue and there'll be there'll be no 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 uh, pause uh, no pause i think um, uh, as you know, on the 5G front, uh, US, Japan, Australia, uh, and India uh, are trying to find uh, ways of cooperating with each other. It will not be easy, uh, but there are strengths that each, com each country has, uh, whether these strengths can be pooled uh, to develop alternative uh, 5G and then a whole issue of standards involved in 5G. So these are big battles uh, to be fought apart from the data issues that I mentioned. Uh, so this is by and large, uh, Mr. Kulikov, some of the comments I thought I'll make uh, specifically on the five subjects that you had outlined. Thank you. Uh, dear Ambassador, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, uh, we have uh, started to organize this seminar, you know, with a funny idea that is this civilization worth saving? Because whenever any solution to any small uh, problem is found, uh, then we have a huge competition, and there is a, a solution. There is no solution to competition. So I mean, that's that's uh, a little bit cynical, but but that's what we see also. I mean, with uh, uh, with all the internet access that we have now, we kind of read about the same uh, uh, papers. We have. Uh, about the same ideas about almost anything. So one of the uh, one of the ways out is to cut the internet of each country from all this variety, but the but the uh, competition will, will nevertheless continue. Then then the, the uh, technical companies will provide us with more sophisticated devices that will help us to uh, somehow find the way to global communication. So global communication itself becomes a kind of a meal that we all eat, but it, it, it has nothing to do with real food. I mean, that's a bit cynical, and I'm very sorry that I'm saying this, but uh, I remember some 20 years ago when we came, when we started this uh, big roads forum, which is now uh, somewhere far away from us. But uh, the same questions: Can we include anything and everything in the world economy? Can we deal with the technical issues? Can we deal with climate change and all that stuff? And we are kind of very happy for uh, uh, about talking for. Uh, I, I mean, we were not the first. There were some other forums, uh, maybe 20 years before us. So we keep on talking <coughs> about different uh, problems with the same approaches, which is power. Power, this is the most serious issue. You know, no one can define when you are in power or not. I remember talking with an old uh, Chinese general 10 years ago. He told me, we never say power though there is a, a special word in, in uh, Chinese characters, because we really do not know when we are in power. So, uh, I mean, competition is to be continued, but uh, I, the only thing I, I, I would not very much agree with you is that 
Chinese seem to be understanding the limits of their control. I mean, uh, uh, you may possibly remember uh, the famous phrase by Deng Xiaoping said sometimes in, in early uh, 90s when they uh, became active, active in United Nations. He said, when China will break all the borders, kill us or something like that. I, I, I found it really in the UN documents. I can, I mean, uh, it's always, you know, kind of a game. You, you persuade someone that you are going to be polite when you come in someone else's house, and then you find it very comfortable to, to manage it. Yes, I mean, no one is, no one is against you. You're too big. Your power uh, is uh, at high, but where is power? I mean, uh, personally, for me, the power is in dialogue. And in, in kind of thinking of the uh, uh, future of my, I don't know, younger children. But, but that's personal. It, nevertheless, I have to obey it. Uh, I have to obey this power game. So uh, uh, thank you very much for your uh, clear answers to all four uh, or five subjects that were uh, proposed for discussion. Uh, we have some agreement with Moscow State University that they will allow us to put this uh, 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 messy conference in a kind of a more uh, uh, balanced publication. And uh, before doing anything and pub publishing anything, I will send it to uh, all of you with, uh, with the remarks that we kind of trying to build the uh, architecture of understanding, which uh, Plato and uh, uh, Aristotle has failed, but we can we can try to do it again. And with a, I mean, I'm a sinologist myself, so I always look at it as a kind of you know, uh, kind of tricky game. I can play games in in, or I pretend that I can play games in. Uh, European style, old European style. Uh, the other people will pretend that they play games, you know, the new Russian style or old Russian style. And I'm absolutely not a specialist on India. But uh, for me, uh, uh, for the last at least two years that we started to uh, work uh, with uh, Indian experts and uh, Indian publications, the idea is to kind of to try to facilitate the, 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 I'm sorry for being a bit rude, voice of India in, in Russian public discourse and try to facilitate it in European public discourse. Because what we really do not know about India is nothing to be compared to what we know. And just, you know, pictures, internet, uh, global communication, nice people and all that. But uh, working there for, um, I mean, uh, uh, with an experience or four or five conferences that I had the chance to do uh, or to try to uh, to push for funding in India, uh, I mean, uh, my idea was I should go out because I understand nothing. So uh, anyway, uh, in a world where everyone is communicating, everyone knows everything uh, about everything, maybe some, some uh, push on India and... Uh, uh, the the region which used to be for uh, let's say for the northerners or so-called westerners i mean russia is western to china so they treat us as westerners they, they don't be cheated by by i mean we are friends and, and all that stuff we are westerners we are responsible for colonialism and all that stuff so uh, uh in my old head and bold almost uh, bold head i, I thought Let's let's try to let's try to work and facilitate uh, people talking about the Indian experience because, uh, uh, in my view, there is something very much similar in the state of economies, in the state of understanding, in political uh, reactions to uh, to uh, different uh, spheres uh, between uh, India and Russia. I mean. You are called more, dem more democratic, we are called more uh, authoritarian, but nevertheless, it's not about the wording, but the way we react, uh, uh, in my personal view, uh, is absolutely, absolutely insane. We, we, we remember all the history of the relations, but it also teaches nothing. So thank you very much again. And... Uh, 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 let me prepare then all the all all what
what has been said already in in in, in a certain booklet or or I mean, I will spend at least a couple of months to do it. Thank you very much again. Uh, uh, Dr. Dibashis Nandi, would you, would you like to take the floor by and turn your mic on? Yes, sir. Just uh, please present yourself because we are kind of more or less acquainted with each other, at least in groups. And please present yourself. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Vladimir uh, Kolikov uh, and other dignitaries. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Kanwal uh, Sibal is the former uh, Secretary of Foreign Affairs of India and, and distinguished uh, diplomat and other dignitaries from Vienna, Moscow and other places. I am delighted to, uh, to be part of this great seminar. Uh, which is organized by jointly by IIES VN Australia and Moscow State University. And I would uh, like to uh, convey my special thanks to uh, Dr. Vladimir uh, Kulikov uh, to in, uh, invite me in the great, great, great gathering. And today uh, I would like to uh, share my views, uh, the India's, uh, India and uh, India and its neighbors in pandemic situation so uh, india is uh, is the largest democracy in the world and it is the emerging global order and uh, with a vibrant demo uh, de democracy india is trying to be a global power. the pandemic situation poses a threat to india's economic growth and as well as its foreign relations like other countries Due to the pandemic COVID-19, India is suffering a lot, financial crisis and other crises. So what is the India's challenge before the pand pandemic COVID-19? Because uh, economic growth rate has been a downfall like other countries and foreign trade uh, volume has been decreased. Uh, alongside India's relations with China, has, uh, has got a setback in the recent past. China is a great threat to Indian security over the decades. China shares common border with India, but China attacked India twice and China uh, actually involved in two full phase war and other shadow wars and partial wars are going on still now. And uh, forcefully, uh, Mr. Kanwal has rightly mentioned the role of China and Mr. Uh, Vladimir Kulikov also mentioned about China. Why to be stopped? So China is uh, with aggressive attitude. China uh, is trying to capture the entire South Asia through the uh, Road and Belt Initiative uh, 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 plan and the Uber. And not only that, to medium silk and China already uh, uh, um, captured the entire South Asian market. And the aggressive role of China not only poses through the, its military aggression, but also economic aggression. So the new strategies uh, have been taken by India in post-COVID period, what is to be done? And the role of Russia is very vital in this regard. In last month, the Russia took a very vital role to negotiate and to mitigate the uh, ongoing Indo-China uh, conflicts. And uh, at Moscow, the trilateral uh, meeting was conducted in presence of Chinese foreign minister. And the, since the very beginning, especially since 1971, with the conclusion treaty of uh, friendship and cooperation, the relations between the former Soviet Union, Arstor Soviet Union and India was so friendly, but after the end of the Cold War, uh, yeah, when the bi uh, bipolar polarity has been uh, 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 has been abolished and the new global order was started, then India decided to maintain a close relations with its former friend, uh, uh, I mean, successive state of uh, Soviet Union, that is Russia, as well as it will establish the relations with the United States of America. And what is going on between India and Russia? Because the role of Russia is in, I have mentioned, India, India's prime, uh, one of the prime destination, uh, uh, in one of the major uh, policies of India's uh, um, foreign relations is Central Asia. So two 
to actually successful conduction in, of its uh, Central Asia uh, policy, the rule of Russia is vital. And the major challenge is Russia. A major challenge is China because China shares borders with some Central Asian countries. And the presence of China is a great threat to in Central Asian region. And in, in, South, in South Eastern Asian region, in, in Pacific region, the China already deployed its military bases. And in South China Sea, the presence of China and its military presence is a great threat to India. So, India is continuing its, uh, uh, its strategic relations with uh, uh, Russia as well as it is maintaining a, a strategic relations with the United States of America. And the, presently, the growing um, synergies between Russia and China is also a, a, a new equations of foreign relations. Now I am coming to the present situation. India is a core state of South Asia. And uh, in terms of economy, in terms of population, in terms of territory, in terms of technology, uh, in terms of manpower, India is a poor state. Some states of South Asia are economically poor and they are technologically backward, like Bhutan, like Afghanistan, like Maldives. Uh, over, the, uh, uh, over the decades, uh, India took a very generous policy towards its South Asian neighbors, uh, right from Nehru to the present government, almost almost all governments actually very much uh, uh, very much uh, uh, careful about uh, about uh, its South Asia policy. But nowadays, that to it is a great challenge to India to manage its South Asian neighbors because through the policy of encirclement, China already uh, not only invested in South Asian states but it also um, dealing with South Asian states militarily. Already, China um, established a port in Gadar in Pakistan, you know, in Hambantota in Sri Lanka, and near Chittagong Airport, another port has been established by China. And already, a new bridge has been established uh, uh, in um, Malay, from Malay, from Rajdhani, the capital city of uh, Maldives, to Malay to the airport city. So, these states, especially Sri Lanka and Maldives, ha had taken a lot of amount. Uh, as a loan from China. So to repay the loan, they are facing a lot of problems. But India is continuously uh, uh, very helpful to our South Asian neighbors. During the pandemic, the role of India is very significant because India is one of the initiators of SARC, South Asian Association for uh, Regional Cooperation, which was established in 1985 to uh, fulfillment of the regional interest. And Jio, former president of Bangladesh, Jio Rahman was another initiator to for formation of SAR. But during the pandemic situation, the government of India had planned to raise a fund to help the South Asian nations, except Pakistan. All of the, um, um, uh, all of the member countries actually contributed as per their capacity. But the role of Pakistan was very much negative. Pakistan didn't contribute a, 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 a single uh, rupees. So Pakistan is creating uh, a lot of problems to run the SARC uh, uh, smoothly. During the pandemic situation, India uh, took a very uh, good initiative to evacuate the South Asian nationals who actually, uh, uh, who, uh, uh, who those people who actually uh, in uh, China, so Air India special flights went there and to uh, guide out those people, Maldivian people, Sri Lankan people. Even government of India had tried to evacuate the Pakistani people who uh, who were in China and other countries. But thing is that the the role of state, uh, the role of state and the attitude of the state has been uh, displayed and exposed during the COVID-19. What kinds of role are playing the South Asian states? One is their economic uh, dependency. Number two, their incapacity to handle COVID-19 in medication, in transport, and to supply chain, which, which has been mentioned by uh, Mr. Sivan. This, the, actually, the supply chain due to COVID-19, the entire supply chain has been uh, disrupted because most of the India supply chain was dependent upon China. But after the Galwan incident, the India has decided to stop the to stop import the Chinese goods 
and uh, and to india is is uh, moving for the self reliance to produce all of the necessary goods in india that is made in india that is another dimension because this is a changing during the pandemic situation in like in in their in their country so this is a new policy i mean dependency uh, to self dependency another thinking regarding the dealing with south asian countries th that is the india's uh, 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 role of generosity and india's role of uh, a, a, as a, a as a core state of south asia during the covid 19 india has supplied foods and other necessary goods to maldives to sri lanka to afghanistan and india has actually uh, helped a lot to southeast asia nations especially uh, indian um, uh, embassy to philippines manila uh, in uh, um, uh, the officials of uh, and other uh, diplomats of uh, manila embassy of india they distributed masks uh, sanitizer and other med medical equipments to the uh, philippine people not only that india agreed to uh, help vietnam cambodia and laos and regarding the uh, india's policy towards west asia it is also vital the india in uh, india helped iran uh, in medication and india supplied the uh, essential uh, medicine uh, that is the uh, hydrochloroquine to iran and uh, mask and other uh, other things and other uh, middle eastern states now i am coming to how india is managing its south asian nations because for the last few years uh, the role of nepal is very much negative towards india and bhutan who which was the very good friend of india maldives which was very good from uh, good friend of india nowadays their foreign policy uh, 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 direction is co china so uh, the role of uh, maldives the role of uh, bhutan and role of uh, and the role of nepal uh, in uh, south asian politics is anti india so it is a great challenge what is the challenge to india because china is assisting them a lot but in terms of uh, money in terms of other uh, things india is not at par with china but these countries are not actually realizing what is the actual motivation of china china is uh, assisting those countries as, as a investor investors as, or as a Uh, or as a hegemonic country because these countries uh, are paying repaying a lot of amount of their total gdp so whenever india is paying india is assisting those countries without any expectation except except diplomatic support but the due to the chinese ex existence in south asia the india south asia policy is greatly hampered in recent times recently another dimension has been noticed in india's foreign policy that is anti uh, and in informal anti chinese block has been uh, established uh, led by the usa and other european states uh, in, in including india uh, minus china and uh, minus china and rest of the democratic countries so a new global order in coming days can be established to uh, counter the china and to suppress the china so what is the strategic uh, threat to india now because india india uh, shares common border with uh, other neighbor south asian neighbor some borders are porous border so due to the porous border and open border india shares common border with Mal um, nepal and bhutan so due to the porous border terrorists and other um, uh, enemies can easily take entry into india so in recent times india is facing the problem of illegal migration and refugees problem in 2019 india already passed new citizenship act amendment act and by this act lot of uh, uh, criticism has been generated against india but india has rightly defended why it has actually passed this uh, bill actually to stop the illegal migrations and to to stop the terrorism the uh, india is facing terrorism over the decades so Uh, india has defended very rightly and india has justified uh, actually uh, stated to the global community it is its internal affair as a sovereign state it can act anything uh, through parliament so at present what is the major challenges of india number one 
final to reconstruct its infrastructure number two uh, to revive its economy number three to revive its relations uh, uh, with china is it feasible or not and uh, that, that is a great debate number four to importance what the importance on russia five whether india will be more dependent on the western countries or or uh, or southeast asian nations or india will give equal emphasis uh, uh, to, uh, to towards uh, uh, europe and towards the southeast asian nations because as a part of india's activist policy india is now is focusing on southeast asian nations the gliding development of south asian nations uh, as uh, very very much important uh, to the study of international uh, politics today because some countries of southeast asia uh, have been the uh, hub of global economy so india is actually connecting with southeast asian nations uh, to fulfill not only its economic interest but also its strategic its cultural its technological relations so uh, in the post covid 19 period uh, india uh, will try to make a balanced foreign policy and uh, and india's role in uh, in combating the covid 19 is uh, uh, very much positive because india not only actually trying to uh, manufacture uh, the own vaccine but al already uh, concluded treaty with russia to get the russian vaccine it will be manufactured in india in the promise to bangladesh uh, uh, our, our uh, foreign secretary visited uh, in august to bangladesh and promised that in Bangla india will supply uh, vaccines to bangladesh and in priority basis because bangladesh is one of the uh, important neighbors of south asia and the present government of bangladesh is led by sheikh hasina is uh, assisting with india uh, to combat terrorism and and uh, and to uh, uh, and to suppress the uh, radical uh, radical uh, uh, religious forces and that is why the india is now is going or moving towards self reliance if india india has manpower india has um, uh, technology india has land india india has a lot of potentialities so india if india can actually uh, produce its own product and can supply it throughout the world that it, its economy will be revived as well as uh, with the uh, with the growth of its economy its uh, its presence in global politics will be more prominent okay thank you for hearing me and give you and thank you to all uh, to giving me an opportunity to share my views with you dr nandi thank you very much you are a very persuasive speaker and uh, uh, hopefully we, we we can also get your text and uh, uh, this will help us a lot in in the task that we are trying to we are trying to fulfill uh may i kindly uh switch to europe for a short uh for a short but very uh important introduction by alexander rar who is the head uh the scientific head of the german russian forum who has uh, a couple of hours ago landed uh, to berlin from moscow he has been participating in the main a yearly event uh, the so-called valdai uh, forum and he has seen uh, russia's president putin and he has very fresh and as always very uh, well formulated reflections because uh, after uh, uh, returning to germany he has to visit the, the doctor because because of the covid we all understand so let uh, yeah. let me take Dear colleagues and dear friends, dear Vladimir, it was really, really a very unique experience to travel in times of Corona, especially from one risk country to another risk country. I mean, you are doing only tests and that's not enough. You have to do more. Um, well, uh, that will change hopefully soon to the better. But uh, let me share with you 
very briefly some some ideas some points which were made uh, in a three day uh, conference in, in in moscow at which also uh, participants from china from india from other parts of the world participated and uh, i would like uh, to come back to what um, andrei kortunov has said about uh, multilateralism i think that uh, his um, his intervention his uh, his remarks uh, were very logical and uh, also due to the point. Uh, but uh, what I think we miss here is that uh, this status quo of how we saw multilateralism in the past uh, 75 years, uh, which stabilized or had to stabilize the world, is dramatically changing now. What do I have in mind? Uh, I um, simply want to, to point out to, to Putin who gave his speech uh, yesterday exactly on the question of um, multilateral cooperation. And you know, he, he, he was in one way, uh, I think in a, in a kind of defensive, he was defending Russia and defending China also and saying, we would like to work uh, more on multilateral uh, kind of cooperation and have this world government in the UN. But, uh, Times have passed in the past uh, three, three, four decades where the stronger West, the strong United States, and the wrong, strong European Union have already monopolized, as were his words, the, um, the rules, uh, the international law. Uh, they have their people in all these institutions, and we feel not being represented. We do not feel that this multilateralism is working. I think it's an important point. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But this is something what is being expressed not only from uh, Russians, but also from Chinese. It's, it, it, it's, it, uh, it was some worrisome for me somehow that uh, Putin chose to, to defend uh, China and support China. And his uh, speech yesterday at the Valda Club, we discu were discussing this uh, also deeply, but he said two things in my mind, which were new and which were alarming. One thing was that China should... Uh, uh, built up its military. Russia is not against it. So China becomes more and more than a nuclear, nuclear uh, country because it, uh, it still has, has, has some opportunities to, to, to develop this because Russia and China and America and, and, and Russia have more nukes than, than, than China. And secondly, he said that he can imagine a military alliance between uh, Moscow and Beijing. Um, what is also new and he said it not to please China. No, he said it in my view, and we understood this in his important speech yesterday, in order to warn the West that uh, enough is enough and uh, let's continue to work on multilateral uh, forms and cooperation, but listen to us as well. Listen to China, listen to Turkey, which he also defended uh, very heavily in this, um, in this round, which also, also, also for some people felt uh, was, was quite strange, but uh, it shows the direction which the world is going, a new bipolarity. And um, in reality, I also detected in this discussion, as I mentioned, there were not only Russians and a couple of Europeans, we had a lot of representatives from Asia there. The dramatic, uh, dramaticness of um, changes in the world, in the world politics are um, enormous, are massive, are very dynamic. We have probably, uh, we will have uh, a major shift and changes in the United States because of the results of the elections in one way or another. Uh, we will, uh, we are seeing the European Union, I will say a couple of words about this, which is also changing uh, dramatically uh, in which direction or whatever, but uh, the EU, uh, I think has not, uh, has not, uh, is still not understanding the fundamentals of these changes. Uh, you, my dearest co colleagues, you spoke about the changes in Asia, which have, of course, something to do with uh, the weakening of the United, uh, the role of the United States economically in this region, and the come up of a uh, huge uh, and stronger China. Whatever that means, we have not discussed uh, dramatic changes in the Middle East, and of course, have not yet discussed. The dramatic changes in Africa, which will lead to to to, to falling 
uh, um, and failed states uh, in this area with consequences for uh, for Europe. And in my mind, the uh, here would maybe also ask Andrei Kortunov later to comment. I think the the present. Uh, the 75-year-old global multilateral institution, which has been created to govern, let's say, the world, to make it safe, um, are not enough, are not sufficient now to um, tackle this, uh, this uh, huge uh, problems. And the international um, community have to, to define new rules, have to sit down and think what to do next. And that is not easy because everyone has vetoes, everyone has his own views on that. And there are new rivalries which are uh, extended and becoming even stronger in, uh, in the Corona times. And now very, very shortly about Europe. And now, what, uh, because you spoke about Asia, I want to share my views also what I uh, listened and heard in, in, uh, in, in, in about the club. Now, the European Union has regarded the past 30 years itself as Europe. The EU is Europe, that was, has been said, but in my view, the European Union is without noticing this correctly, losing its uh, mon monopoly on, uh, on Europe. Uh, Great Britain is leaving uh, the European Union and uh, is, at least in the terms of security, oriented orienting itself towards the United States. The United States will also, if Biden wins, have difficult relations with Europe, will continue to regard Europe less than a 100% follower or 100% um, ally, but also as a rival uh, on the economic uh, stage in, in globalization. That is, these problems have started not under Trump, they have started uh, longer ago. So we will see tensions in the transatlantic world, which will face Europe um, with new challenges, with new, it will, Europe will have to find new solutions and emancipate itself in many ways, also the United States, without, of course, joining Russia or China, but nevertheless, Europe will have to make a very important strategic choice. We see, we see China approaching politically now from the East uh, into, uh, into Europe also making itself dependent uh, certain countries, uh, weaker countries in the, in, through financial means in the European Union. The Chinese factor is underdeveloped and underestimated in the European Union, but uh, experts, uh, or political scientists who deal with this uh, see it uh, quite clearly how it grows. We are seeing uh, the role of Turkey, which is in confrontation with the European Union, which made a historical choice for itself, not joining the European Union, departing from, uh, from the EU accession into something else, maybe by starting to build its, its Osmanic Empire again, in the weaker form, of course, in a softer form. Nevertheless, uh, it, it goes in sort of this direction. And Turkey is not even uh, hiding its amb ambitions and ready also to do it also through military conflicts, uh, maybe with, with, with Greece in terms of the military, military uh, sea exploration of gas, or now in Nagorno-Karabakh, where it's the support supporting the Azeri side. Uh, it has its ambitions plans, which coin, which do not coincide with, uh, with those of the European Union, which are contrary to them. And then the problems with Russia, which are not solvable. And I don't think that the European Union and Russia have geopolitical problems, territorial problems. Uh, no, I think it's, and it's not NATO and European Union, it's um, more a cultural and civilizational conflict. And it became also clear in the discussion with Putin, where he always stresses at these uh, meetings at the Baltic with experts that uh, Russia is building a different Europe. It does not want to leave Europe, but it's building a different Europe on other traditions uh, as the postmodern uh, uh, world, which, uh, which, uh, is important for the European Union. So the European Union uh, will face uh, a stark choice uh, how to cooperate with its new actors and actors on the European continent, which uh, sometimes, and uh, maybe mostly in political terms, will, uh, will uh, also become rivals of the European Union. Again, it's Great Britain. America and China from outside, Russia, which wants to have its place in Europe, and Turkey, which is fighting, of course, uh, for its place now in, in Europe on the same continent. You know, this is my description, understanding of, uh, of, of, 
of the future of Europe, which uh, which isn't tragic. It's uh, maybe not so dramatic as I put it now in my words. But nevertheless, we have to think about it. So all the things uh, the world is really doing in, in, in coronavirus will only, you know, ex uh, 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 strengthen all this, uh, all this, will become a dominator for, for, for all these conflicts. And you, uh, we have to watch and be careful and think seriously about this. And I congratulate the organizers of this conference that they brought in so many very intelligent people here who have something to say. Uh, uh Dear Alexander, thank you very much for uh, clearing up the the uh, the vision of, of the Russian relation with Europe and vice versa. There is uh, 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 one peculiar thing when we uh, talk about uh, turn to the east. Uh, Europeans do understand uh, Russian culture. They have read almost all of the books that has been translated during a couple of hundred of years into German, French, and English, same with us. We do understand Europe, and we, we can maintain, let's say, people here in Moscow, that we are building another Europe, but we can't build another China, because there are very few people who speak Chinese here. It's a completely terra incognita. Same goes to India. So. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, Russia and Europe will always be a part of the same, but always fighting uh, because of absolute uh, uh, understanding. And but on the other side, trying to trying to reunite. So that's uh, thank you very much for uh, clearing the official position of the Russian government. And uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes. Uh, uh, it seems that uh, when we talk about uh, the rise of Asia, we are inviting everyone into a new, uh, let's say, endeavor. But that's that's also an oversimplification because uh, uh, most of the uh, these countries have their not only their civilizations or can or cultures, but are absolutely adapted to this uh, post-systemic chaos and uh, sometimes inviting uh, uh, ourselves into a new country, into a new culture uh, may be a bit adventurous, but then you have adventures from the other side. So, uh, and you must understand that they are already, uh, they are already made their choices also, which doesn't make our profession of uh, bringing and people together and bridging uh, uh, relations easier, but that's how it goes. Uh, I would love to hear uh, uh, Dr. Pong Karpinkie's remark on, on what we've been talking about. He's a great specialist uh, and uh, very famous, both in France, in India, and in Russia, with, with a little, with a very little help of, of all of us, but uh, he kind of uh, has the vision that possibly we lack, and uh, uh, I, I'm very happy to give him the floor to somehow try to finalize all this discussion. Good afternoon, good evening. Can you hear me clearly? Uh, Excellencies, uh, Dr. Kulikov, uh, dear friend, thank you for inviting me to this new chapter or panel of the uh, globalistics uh, conference of the of moscow state university when we uh, talked uh, dr kulikov i and a few others about uh, the planning of this uh, seminar uh, obviously i saw the number of uh, topics that uh, was being evoked uh, by dr kulikov who is uh, like many of you a very polyphasetic mind and a very broad thinker. So he tries to integrate as many factors as possible and that makes for a very interesting uh, debate, but it doesn't make it easy always to uh, focus on concrete and perhaps pragmatic uh, proposals. So what I've tried to do is, uh, without wanting to be provocative, I have tried to look at a very possible or even likely outcome of the current turmoil. And I have tried to focus on the possibility, without pretending to be a prophet, 
but just on the possibility that China becoming, in fact, the strongest economic power could uh, be already reshaping the world. I won't say in its image, but certainly with a lot of its uh, input and find out what the implications and possible reactions would be to that state of affairs. I want to make it clear that I'm not here making a value judgment. I'm not promoting the Chinese model, nor am I putting it down, although we know what the problems are. I think Ambassador Sibal and others have talked about uh, the particular issues that China has uh, essentially aroused uh, with many countries. But what we should notice, and I will be very brief because I understand I should speak for more than 15 minutes. I would like to say first that there is no question, and this has been uh, said by some of the previous speakers, that the Chinese response to the current crisis, both economically and uh, sanitary, because I do not separate the COVID pandemic from the ongoing economic crisis, which had begun before the pandemic. And in a way, the pandemic was piggybacked on it. And you can see that many of the financial regulatory authorities found it in a way, a very almost timely, if I were to be cynical, very timely explanation for the measures that have to be taken to reform the world economy. So what we are looking at right now is clearly the uh, West being confronted, or at least the leading powers, the West metaphorically includes Japan, being confronted by the rise of another economic uh, configuration, which at this point is uh, very much seen as China, but which involves quite a few other countries in the Far East, but also in Southeast Asia, and increasingly in Central Asia and the Middle East. Now, in contrast to the Chinese uh, approach and the Chinese uh, way of tackling the pandemics, what is very striking is the general inefficiency and confusion in Western countries. And I will go further than some of the real speakers by saying without uh, taking to gloves that a lot of that confusion controversy denotes the failings of the so-called liberal democratic system. And when we say democracy, we tend to take it as a blanket terms and not question it too much. You know, we say great democracies as opposed to authoritarian countries or traditional monarchies. But then we realize that there are so many differences between the so-called uh, advanced democracies and not so advanced democracies, and also so many internal contradictions and so many things that are essentially not really addressed I mean, is the United States a really democratic country? There are very valid questions about that, you know. And uh, we can certainly say that the American system is a sui generis system. It carries the imprint of American history and of American society, but it doesn't necessarily correspond to democratic ideals in other parts of the world. The same can be said about Britain, a monarchy which has traditionally been an oligarchy, with some participation from other sections of the population. And I could go on and on. And of course, if you look, for example, at uh, Scandinavian countries, they may perhaps offer in many ways the closest to a democratic authenticity as far as their internal organization. By the way, that doesn't always reflect in foreign policy. We know that foreign policy has many different uh, objectives and imperatives. Now, back to what I was saying about China. Uh, we find that the effectiveness of the Chinese response to the pandemic and to its recovery uh, can lead us to consider some of the basic features of China as it is emerging. And I will list them very briefly. One is the adoption of the social credit system, which is a very interesting counterbalancing factor to the sole rule of the economic system. I don't have time to go into it, but we are just publishing now at the India Foundation a book written by a French Indo-Sinologist who has looked very closely at the, on the ground at the, essentially the, the, the creation of the social credit point system and how it is affecting Chinese society, both uh, for good and perhaps in some ways for evil. 
The sophisticated electronic surveillance and monitoring of the population is another great feature, very visible feature of Chinese uh, society. The reforms towards elimination of poverty, which are being pursued at the, on a war footing. The achievement of a circular economy, which is coming very quickly, I should say, quicker than could be expected. Uh, also, the focus on the renewable energy generation, on industrial and technological autonomy, which is a new factor in China, as in many other countries, because I think there is a realization that China cannot depend on foreign markets and on exports to other countries, but rather should focus on creating its own autonomous, self-contained market, which could consume its own production. So we get, we get to industrial and technological autonomy, uh, that's going to be accelerated by what's happening now between Huawei and the American uh, electronics and uh, informatic companies. Digitalization of currency, very fundamental, very important. And finally, uh, the growing importance of envir sound environmental planning in development uh, projects and in development thinking. Now, this, of course, means that uh, the efficiency of the People's Republic of China in pursuing these objectives, often addressed what we might call consider great human cost, shows that there are certain inevitably valid points in the way in which China conceives society and the individual's relation to society. I think the West suffers from a grave crisis of individualism, which has gone unchecked and which has become unmanageable. And I would take, uh, in the spirit of modesty, my own country, France, as an example, where protests have become the, uh, essentially the social game for everybody at any time over anything. And we see the enormous waste of resources, time, credibility incurred in this endless protest, which basically achieve nothing but make the situation worse. And in fact, we, we see now the very effect of what is affecting Western societies, uh, for example, the spread of corruption. I don't want to go into it now, but uh, it's uh, very visible that Western societies are become in many ways as corrupt as the famed developing countries, which used to be given that label. And again, I could quote uh, my country, and particularly with regard to the COVID crisis, which has uh, essentially shown spectacular instances of corruption, very often, I must say, aided and abetted by the government. So now, where we have seen this picture, we relativize the, of course, the evils that we can impute to China. And we can come to some sort of a vision of a synthetic or a, um, I would say, a convergent concept of civilization, which could include the best elements of West as well as East. And I will end by listing uh, eight features of current uh, development uh, pro processes, which are common to China and the rest of the world. And what is very noteworthy is that in almost all of these eight different uh, chapters, China is either leading or is come to taking over leadership. And that in itself is not only uh, due to Chinese excellence, but it's also due to the very fast decline of leading Western societies, beginning with the United States. So the eight features which are known to you are first, automation, robotization, and computerization of work, administration, medical care, economic and social management, law and order, and increasingly the judicial and even the governance systems. In other words, we are going to live very soon in societies which will be largely controlled, managed, and even guided by non-human automated systems. Artificial intelligence, blockchain, uh, big data, analysis, etc. Second, pervasive electronic surveillance, monitoring, and data collection, and analysis of human behavior in all its aspects. China is the leader in that field, but many countries in uh, the West are not far behind. And again, I could quote the United States, but Britain is also in the, you know, uh, first uh, peloton de tête, as we say in French, in the, the first cluster. Third, attempt to restore greater autonomy and self-sufficiency to national and regional economies, 
in order to shorten and secure supply chains and create greater protection from crisis and disasters affecting other parts of the world. I have already mentioned this. Fourth, serious consideration are being, is being given to proposal to protect large sections of the population from absolute poverty. There we go back to the schemes for universal basic income. Uh, where we, uh, as uh, has been said by when, in one of the previous speeches, uh, given the massive worldwide long-term or permanent unemployment, which is a result of the current crisis and of the COVID-19 related depression, I could quote here the World Economic Forum, which has just forecast the definitive loss of more than 80 million jobs in the next five years and the replacement of half of human workers by machines in the same span of time, at least in what we might call the golden billion and a half or the golden two billion, which are, of course, the more affluent uh, section of, of global society. Fifth, a growing effort to replace fossil fuel-based energy generation by renewable and non-conventional breakthrough power sources as part of the shift to a green or greener sustainable economy, and eventually a full circular economy. So as you can see, the trends I'm uh, enumerating are not necessarily positive or negative. They must have both aspects to them, and we must uh, rationally establish what are the aspects to be encouraged and what are the aspects that are sources of work. Sixth, an acceleration of modernization in the area of communication and social networking manifested in the transition to 5, 6, and 7G. Let's not forget that we talk about 5G, but 5G is already almost yesterday's news. Uh, both China, the US, and other countries are already talking and planning for 6 and 7G. So that, of course, means multiplication of social media platforms, browser, the spread of the Internet of Things, and an increasingly, uh, essentially, you might say, an increasingly uh, intelligent society or at least increasingly intelligent and i mean intelligent not necessarily in the positive sense but uh, network objects which are communicating with each other and which human beings are only one of the actors seven rapid digitalization and cryptogrammation of currencies and financial instruments spearheaded by bitcoin and by the dg1 china will be uh, probably the first uh, will produce the first state-backed currency that will be used and traded globally purely on a digital basis on the basis of blockchain. Eighth and last, acceleration and partial privatization of the space race between the major powers, both in the military and civilian dimensions, aimed at increasing the reliance on the resources found in space to fuel the further expansion and transformation in technology and society. You all know that the Artemis Agreement between eight countries has been signed recently for uh, joint exploitation and regulation of the exploitation of the resources on the moon. It's interesting that among these eight countries, Russia and China or India are not included. So we'll have to see how negotiations will uh, take place in the coming years. So now I will conclude by saying that if China is going to be essentially the leader in terms of both economic power, population size, strategic reach, in many of those disciplines, we are not going to get here into whether that will create a global war, because we all know about the Thucydides trap and how the incumbent power tries to repress the rise of the rising power, the rise of the upcoming power by creating coalitions. This has been done for history. We all know about the coalitions to try to uh, bring down the Netherlands, I mean, Spain, the Netherlands, France, Russia, Germany, all those coalitions uh, tried to control a state that was becoming too powerful for its neighbors. And I would say that by and large, coalitions did not succeed because the unity of one state is generally more effective than a coalition of more or less willing or uh, more or less uh, resolved partners. So I will then leave you with the reflection that these changes that are taking place are going to see a major revisitations, re 
considerations of the concept of democracy as it was conceived in the dominant nations of 18th, 19th century Europe and America within liberal bourgeois society, which were then supported by colonial exploitation of colonial exploitation of other lands, or who were, which were former colonies themselves, like the United States or Latin American countries. So discoveries in human psychology and technological transformation show those two century old models to be increasingly dysfunctional and unresponsive. Local cultural and social political patterns will bring about pragmatic reforms that may be described as post democracy, which is something that is being used already by scholars such as Hershey in Canada. He calls it post democracy and juristocracy. That's a particular version of what's taking place in the West. So, there we see that the procedures which characterize classical Western democracy are being challenged. And therefore, the attempt of the United States and some European countries to impose certain democratic forms of government in their image on other parts of the world have failed historically and will not succeed in the coming years. So as a result of that, I would say that many aspects of the current dispensations in most regions of the planet may already be qualified as de facto post-democratic, as argued by various scholars. There is little that a pragmatic convergence in terms of organization and forms of management is taking place between East and West, and particularly between China and the Atlantic West. It is time to make a clear distinction between the valuable and replicable elements of China's system and those that should not be adopted or initiated. And that is where other cultures, such as the Indian, the Middle Eastern, the European can be uh, brought into uh, the discussion to create a harmonious uh, coexistence between various models. Thank you very much. Uh, dear Kohn, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you have introduced us into a post Fukuyama world. So uh, probably some of the some of the uh, measuring uh, uh, instruments that we use will also be changed. Otherwise, we'll be lost in 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 a more frustration than we are. But that's just a, a small remark to uh, introduce another distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Mohan Guruswami. I'm sure that uh, he's more than known in India, but for the Russian audience, he is the Distinguished Fellow at the United Service Institution of India, New Delhi, and a visiting professor at the Administrative Staff College of India, Hyderabad. Uh, could, you, uh, could you make some remark, uh, dear Professor? Okay, can you hear me now? Thank you very much for <clears throat> inviting me to this gathering and to this webinar. I would restrict myself to a few comments. One is on the Indian economy. We have been among the bigger economies. We have been the one which has been most hit. Our GDP was already on the descent for the last three years, slowing down. We've had a growth recession. Now we have entered a full recession. Now we uh, will contract this year after the COVID crisis, 21-22. Our GDP, the IMF says we contract by 12%. We are all who are inside the country. We believe that the GDP will contract by 16 to 18%. That's a huge hit. And our society is organized very differently from Western societies. Out of a workforce of 480 million people, we have about 400 million people in the unorganized sector. Unorganized sector basically means daily wage earners, people who get go to work and get paid in the day, in the evening, for having done a day's work. And these are people without unions, without the guarantee of minimum wages. Everything here works on supply and demand situations. So, Normally, the wages are pretty low, relatively. It just about will take them past the government-established poverty line. 
Now, out of those 400 million people, we have, in the first week of lockdown, when the government has shut everything down, the Prime Minister came to the country, gave us four hours notice, and said from midnight, everything's going to shut down. We lost, in that first week, we lost 120 million daily wage jobs. 120 million people were without money for their daily expenditures. And all these people live, 68 to 70 percent of their wages are spent on food and living. So suddenly, you can imagine so many million homes without the fires bur burning in the Okay. Professor, do you hear us? Professor Guruswani, are you there? Okay. What shall we do at this moment when, when we, I mean, uh, when we lost him? Okay, possibly he is trying to reconnect. Let's let's give him a try. Okay. Okay, so if he comes back then uh, we can switch him in. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Professor Guruswami is very active, at least in Facebook, and uh, I, I've come personally to know him from his uh, uh, great publications there, covering almost all of the aspects of uh, socio-economic life of India, and uh, it was really a pleasure to have him with us, because the numbers and the figures that he gives are uh, much more persuasive and uh, than, than, you know, many uh, government official statements, at least for those who are trying to observe India. And I'm very grateful to him. And uh, let's, let's think, Shall, I mean, we have about all of, all of the speakers who uh, already uh, has been invited, uh, made their presentations. Uh, let me, let me try to formulate in a day from today what kind of practical suggestions could come out from this seminar, because there were also some ideas that we do this seminar for a certain reason, or for uh, a number of reasons. I will, I will uh, uh, send you the, uh, some idea that already came up uh, about uh, publishing uh, a special booklet uh, in... Uh, Moscow State University, and I will also talk with Andrei Kartunov, who, uh, who is interested and who has been advised by the government to enlarge the uh, information flow which he publishes on uh, uh, Russian International Affairs Council. So, uh, I mean, we are more about research and academic studies or cultural studies, and RIAC is more about, you know, practical policy. So maybe, maybe uh, if, if you are not against it, uh, like His Ex Excellency, just uh, Andrei will write you something about uh, possible publications on his website. And I know that you are, uh, uh, that you know each other for quite a long time. And uh, there has been also some, uh, uh, I mean, uh, presentation of uh, railroad people in our seminar last time and this time, and hopefully this will also lead to to some uh, practical uh, uh, possibility. I know that Russian railways are uh, they are in the period of reporting now because they have this great uh, 1520, if you know what I mean, conference which they are ending in Sochi, and they have to report their activities for a year. And from what I know, 
uh, they are looking for a possibility to uh, make a better uh, uh, in, uh, return to India because they, they, they have been doing it several times and uh, not very much successfully, but they have uh, some uh, new people on board who are absolutely uh, railroad professionals, not politicians, not economists, not anything. So uh, this will also could lead to some uh, uh, stimulation of uh, bilateral relations and uh, which could lead also to some practical results. Thank you very much for participation. Thank you very much for our host, uh, Alexander Gasparishvili on the side of the Moscow State University. Without his generosity, this all wouldn't have happened. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. It was a very interesting and meeting. And I hope, I hope we'll meet again. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you all. Bye-bye. <laughs> Спасибо всем, спасибо. А, 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 а